Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, everyone. Pick up the greeting that is, is most suited to you. Uh, my name is Maria Laura Marcello, and I am uh, a Max Weber Fellow here at the UI in Florence, and I am affiliated to the law department. And together with me is Dr. Takuya uh, Onoda, who is also a Max Weber Fellow here, affiliated to the political and social science uh, department. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome you to this first Max Weber Book Roundtable. It's the first one of 2022. And we're particularly thrilled to have uh, a conversation with the authors of a very inspiring book entitled Six Faces of Globalization, Who Wins, Who Loses, and Why uh, It Matters. Uh, the book has, was named as one of the best books uh, of 2021, and it already featured in Amazon bestsellers in international uh, and foreign law, in Fortune magazine's best books of 2021, and also in the Financial Times 10 best books, uh, economics books, sorry, of 2021. So uh, welcome, Nicholas and Antia. It's a pleasure to have you uh, to have you asked with uh, with to have you with us today. Yes, uh, welcome again, um, and it's a great pleasure to introduce our two distinguished uh, speakers who uh, teamed up and wrote this book and today uh, came us to give a talk uh, from different parts of the world and uh, and also different time zones. Um, professor Ansia Roberts is professor in the School of Regulation and Governance at Australian National University. She's also of the prize winning book is International Law International, published from Oxford University Press. In 2019, she was named uh, the world's leading international law scholar by uh, the League of, League, League of Scholars. Professor Nicholas Lamp is associate professor in the Faculty of Law at Queen's University in Ontario, Canada. He was previously a disputed settlement lawyer at the World Trade Organization. He has published widely on international trade lawmaking. So welcome again, um, Antia and Nicholas. Thanks for um, coming. Um, and first, uh, could you tell us a little about uh, the book? Uh, now the floor is yours. Well, the origins of the book um, go back to 2015, 2016. And, and what, what animated us was really trying to understand the, the sudden backlash against globalization in the West. So you may remember in 2015, we had these uh, massive demonstrations in many European cities against the TTIP ag agreement. And then, of course, in 2016, we have um, the election of Donald Trump and, uh, and the Brexit vote. And one, one thing that we found striking about the debate that followed these movements is that many of our, our colleagues um, in, the, in the academy, but also many international organizations, really adopted very defensive posture towards these challenges, um, trying to... Um, essentially drown the opponents in data about the benefits of globalization. And we, at the time, wanted to take a step back and, and try to really understand these uh, emerging narratives on their own terms. Uh, in my case, I was also particularly fascinated by the question of how these right-wing critiques of globalization related to the left-wing critiques that we were more familiar with. So if you think of the Battle of Seattle, um, it's mostly, it was mostly labor unions and NGOs who, who were criticizing globalization. Now suddenly you have Trump coming from the right, um, proposing a very similar critique. And so I was interested in the relationship between these narratives. And, and Anthea was particularly looking at the evolving US-China relationship. And so when we teamed up, it was an attempt to, to map the, the narrative terrain. We, we wanted to, uh, to provide um, guidance uh, to the debate. And the first step for that to do that was to, to try to take these narratives on their own terms, take them at face value, and, and give sympathetic accounts of each of the different uh, narratives. And I think I'll come in here. So first of all, thank you so much for having us. It's, it's lovely to be there, even if just virtually. Um, but I think there, there were sort of two things going on in this book for us. So on one level, this is a book about the pushback against economic globalization and trying to sort of disaggregate and understand the six main narratives we see driving debates and what's behind them and where do they intersect? Where, do they, where are they similar? Where are they different? What does it suggest for policymaking? So on one level, it's very much about economic globalization. But on another level, this book is really taking economic globalization as simply an example 
of a complex and evolving field or problem. And part of our interest here is in saying, when you're trying to understand complex and evolving fields, how do you do that? And one of the ways you do that is through multi-perspective taking. So looking at different ways of understanding the problem, which we did here through the use of different narratives. And it's very much an approach of what we call, or what psychologists call integrative complexity, which involves trying to unpack multiple different perspectives and seeing an issue from many different sides with many shades of gray, but then trying to give structures to integrate those different perspectives. We use here a bunch of different metaphors for that. So we use a Rubik's cube metaphor for understanding the six different narratives and how they relate. We use Venn diagrams, we use various sort of frameworks in the work that we're doing going forward. So we're trying to sort of unpack complexity and then put it back together in ways that will be useful for people to be able to get traction on this complex topic and be able to move forward with it. Thank you. Uh, well, let's follow up on this uh, methodological uh, framework, this theoretical uh, approach. So Taku and I have a couple of questions that uh, blended nicely together. And I'd like to start with a question about perceptions, which, as you uh, may know, is a topic very dear to me. And my question is, uh, in this context, who does establish if a threat is real or, or perceived. And, and of course, I when, when putting together this, this question, I was thinking uh, to the trade wars. So we have witnessed that there have been uh, an increasing uh, tendency to equate national security with economic security. And of course, I'm referring to the US annual security review that was included in there. Uh, in the 2017 and I think also in the 2018 uh, edition, and that was also invoked to justify the introduction of a number of tariffs. And that seems also to um, indicate a new reorientation, a new direction for the US, but I suspect the US is not alone in this new reorienting where the US, but as I was saying, possibly other states uh, are not uh, are no longer considering themselves bound by the constraint of trade obligation in the name of uh, economic security and therefore the protection of national security. So I think what my question could also be framed in terms of where to draw a line between protection against threats that are indeed real and are indeed likely to pose a danger and protectionism against perception or threats that are perceived as dangerous, but they may not be that likely uh, dangerous uh, in the end. I'll end over to Takuya was a follow-up question and then we'll give you the floor. Thank you. Thanks, Maria Raura. I also have a question about uh, your analytical framework and especially about the relative roles between uh, human agency and political institution, the institutional structure. So one of the most fascinating parts uh, to me of the book uh, is um, analyzing how actors can skillfully frame the debate and um, build a coalition between different uh, proponents of different narratives, and, uh, and also which leads you to conclude that it is important to look at potential alliances and overlaps between different narratives and how you can blend them and have more integrated way of thinking. At the same time, um, it seems to be that in many instances, the power of the narratives is also driven by political struggles channeled uh, through uh, democratic institutions. So um, in NAFTA renegotiation uh, that appears in the book, um, at some point the US position uh, shifted towards uh, what you call corporate power narrative because um, the uh, con Congress uh, and how, especially the House was controlled by the Democrats. So it was more about the concession rather than sort of creating broad arching coalition um, on different actors. And also um, some trade agreements like TRIPS uh, that also appears in the book address the rights to health issues um, in developing countries, not just because it's um, intrinsic barriers, it's more because um, out of advocacy in the developed countries, um, in developed countries, you know, and created media attention, which uh, make politicians worry about next election. So it seems to me the many things uh, are driven by sort of naked power politics. So I guess uh, my question is, to what extent do these uh, kinds of rules of game in politics 
uh, can constrain which narratives are on the table and, and how much power uh, they have relative to each other? Or uh, do you instead think that um, human agencies and actors have more uh, room for maneuver and have creativity in matching and mixing different narratives? Um, thank you. And so now the floor is yours. Right, but Nicholas, should I start? Uh, sure, um, so let me start um, with the first question, which is about to who judges real or perceived threats and what this means. So let me just back up to say when I Nicholas had said I, I had been interested in the geoeconomic narrative rising, and one of the reasons that I've become interested in that at a very early stage is I, I, I'm sort of now in an interdisciplinary group. And I was really aware that there were very strong rising concerns about China and cybersecurity and technology that to me had not yet infiltrated at all into the ways of thinking in the trade world. And I saw these sort of two communities developing that sort of have very different understandings that my sense was were going to completely collide. And when those two worlds started to collide, which really happened with the Huawei decision, I saw a very strong instinctive reaction from many in the um, in the trade law community that this was just trumped up. This was just, you know, um, protectionism under a different name. And I think some of the tariffs that we saw out of Trump were very much protectionism under a different name. I think some of what's going on is something very different. And I think what's happening at the moment is that there's there's a reevaluation of what counts as security in a world where there's a lot of economic interdependence and a lot of digital connectivity. And so I think if you look at the main states of the US and Europe and China, they're all redefining the understanding of economics and security and re the relationship between the two. And this will fundamentally, I think, change the trade law system. That being said, I think what we're actually seeing at the moment is that many of these issues have a hologram-like quality to them, where there is both a protectionist motivation and some other motivation. So the other motivation could be security, we're seeing it with environment, we're seeing it with worker rights. And one of the difficulties going forward is going to be that many of these things are actually protectionist and something else. And how do we deal with that in a, in a system where it looks like a violation from one perspective and not like a violation from another? In terms of agency and uh, so um, and sort of how much constraint people have, so I'm always somebody who thinks it's it's never structure or agency; it's always structure and agency. It's very clear that when we've talked to politicians, that many of them understand the power of these narratives and they live in this narrative world. Uh, some of them play the narratives and go to the extremes because they feel that that's rewarded by the um, the media and it's rewarded by social media. Whereas others are consciously trying to mix and match different narratives and become sort of more centrist coalition building agencies. So I think you can see environments that both push you in certain directions, but also that, that different actors can navigate those environments in different ways. Nicholas. Yeah, I also start with the first question. There's a lot to, to unpack here. So we, uh, we have, of course, a, a part of a chapter that discusses US trade policy specifically with, with respect to China. And uh, what we try to show there is that you indeed have these measures which are in the area of overlap between different narratives, which means that they can be justified based on one narrative and, and, and another narrative. And what we try to argue in that, in that chapter is that it's not um, always clear what, what it means for a measure to be in that area of overlap. It really depends on the context. So in some cases, and that uh, I would give the example of the tariffs that the US has imposed on China, um, the section three, so-called section 301 tariffs, there, there's a broad political consensus in favor of these tariffs. You see the Biden administration hasn't touched them because they can be supported for different reasons, right? For, for some, for Trump, they were probably purely protectionist. They, they erected tariff barriers um, protecting US manufacturers created an incentive for reshoring. But for others, they could also be seen as a bargaining chip. So for those who thought that, well, ultimately we want to get to a free trade system, but in order to get there, we have to reform China's markets. We need some, we need some leverage, right? And so there was this, um, the ambiguity about what the ultimate purpose of these tariff was actually helped them. It, it helped to establish a, a broad support, um, uh, coalition of support. In other areas, and, and you mentioned the security issue, um, 
being in the area of overlap and subject to different interpretation can actually sabotage both narratives. And uh, the example I want to give here is the measures that the Trump administration uh, took against Huawei, where if it's really a national security issue, you wouldn't want to, this should be non-negotiable. This should be so important that um, clearly um, you, you cannot negotiate about it. But what Trump did, of course, he went ahead and um, suggested that the Huawei measures were a bargaining chip in the trade negotiations, could be dealt with in the trade negotiations. And what is the effect of this ambiguity about the purpose of the measure? It means that um, it, it essentially defeats both narratives because for those who um, want to have them seen as national security measures, their credibility is undermined. Because if you're suggesting that they're bargaining chip, nobody is going to believe their security measures. Whereas if Trump wanted to really use them as a bargaining chip, well, what did the Huawei measures do? Because they seemed non-negotiable and not really subject to normal give and take and trade negotiations like tariffs might be, they just spurred China to, to double down on indigenous innovation, right? And, and so they became that ever less effective as a bargaining chip. And so this is a... Uh, this is an example where being subject to these different adaptations actually sabotages uh, both narratives. So um, we, we don't really say what is the right, that there's one right interpretation. We really in the book describe the effects of um, measures being subject to a potentially different uh, interpretation. On the political PowerPoint, it's, 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 it's a similar comment. You're absolutely right that which narrative is ascendant and which is on, on the decline depends on political power relations on, on movements. And um, this is not a sociological book that explains why a particular narrative has risen to the forefront. Of course, we, we, we report the stories that the narratives tell themselves about why, why, why certain um, uh, things have happened. But we, what, we, what we want to show is that, look, these narratives are out there. And as a political actor, you can tap into them. Um, and, and they're not going to go away just because a particular actor disappears. Um, and so really what one purpose of the book is to show that there are narratives with a particular structure, which, which um, identify certain actors as development actors that identify certain distributive flows as the ones that we have to pay attention to. And they're probably going to stick around. And, and, and you see actors uh, that are coming to the scene, appropriating them. You see other actors disappearing from the scene. But they're probably with us for a while. Uh, they're going to be. They have always been with us in, in some shape or form. The relative power between the narratives has changed, but they're not going to go away anytime soon. Thank you so much, Anthea and Nicholas. Um, our second set of questions uh, is related to the state, uh, which I think deserve um, extended discussion. So one uh, central debate in globalization in back in 1990s and 2000s was whether the state uh, is losing their authority and power uh, because of the uh, mobility of capital. Um, but uh, when we look at the current uh, debate and also the um, the challenger narratives that you talked about in the book. Uh, what I find interesting is um, now the debate seems to be much less revolving around uh, more than their state, but how the state can use its power for what kind of purposes and, and what means. For example, uh, whether we pro prioritize security concern or economic uh, openness, or whether um, we um, have we tackle climate change uh, by what means and for what kind of constituencies. So um, my question is, um, could you give us a little bit of um, thought about how, to what extent and in what ways uh, the role of the state has changed? Um, and Maria Laura also has a question. Yeah, I have a follow-up question that relates more to the role of the judiciary. So we have witnessed uh, an increasing reliance on the judiciary, especially when it comes to international economic law. But I think this is a trend that is happening also in other uh, legal areas. And what we have uh, witnessed is that there have been a, an increasing tendency to frame questions in legal terms, so to frame uh, legal issues. Um, but these issues are often problems that have a marked uh, political connotation. Uh, so my question would be, what role for the judiciary when politically sensitive issues are, are at stake, uh, especially if uh, unadjudicated outcome uh, risk undermining the system? And of course, my mind goes to the appellate body crisis. 
that if one thing has demonstrated us that there are limits to the extent to which the international community that states um, are willing to accept uh, this judicial decision as a substitute for policy uh, making unreservedly. So uh, I think this blended nice, nicely with what uh, Takuya just uh, just asked about the role of state, but also what is the role for, for the judiciary in this uh, globalizing uh, system. Thank you. Um, maybe let, let me start with the judiciary because I, I used to work at the um, at the upper body secretariat and um, I actually don't think it's necessarily a turn away from um, dispute settlement more broadly. I think the the reasons for the upper body crisis are more complex. And there's actually a different part of the book which which speaks to that. It doesn't concern the substantive narrative, but it concerns the importance of diversity in in um, in bringing forward a different perspective on a complex problem. And let me just um, give give an example, which is why does the the Apple body crisis uh, why why did it happen? It really happened because a disagreement between the United States and the Apple body and, and much of the rest of the membership about the interpretation of US trade remedy of, of, of the trade remedies parts of the W2 agreement. And as I've been reflecting back on the crisis, it's a crisis that has been going on for 20 years uh, since uh, the early 2000s. And um, as I've been reflecting on it, I, I felt that one aspect of the book that can really shed a diversity um, a light on it is this idea that you need to have diversity in perspective when you ap approach complex problems. And now if you look at the Apple body, the Apple body was clearly diverse in many ways. You had different nationalities, you had a uh, gender balance, but um, both at the appeal level uh, among the Apple body members and the Apple body secretariat, you really had no diversity of perspectives when it came to that crucial issue, namely the issue of um, how, what is the role of trade remedies um, in, in, in international trade? Right. So we, we had an American on the secretariat, but he didn't come from the trade remedies bar. He came from from the State Department. So there I feel almost that there was an inability on, on the part of the secretariat and, and the, maybe the Apple body more broadly to really grasp what how what what the Apple body was doing was being perceived in the United States, how it was um, affecting the US willingness to submit to, to dispute settlement. And, and and one concrete manifestation of was that uh, that the membership, when presented by with two different U.S. Apple Body members, um, one who was a more radical in favor of trade remedies, and one who was kind of a more centrist uh, person, always picked the centrist one. They always, they never went for the one who was seen as presenting a more radical view, which would have departed more radically from the rest of the Apple Body. And in hindsight, I think that was a mistake because if they had brought that perspective on board, maybe there would have been a greater awareness on the Apple Body about what how what the everybody was doing was was being perceived uh, from the outside. And so um, the lesson here is, I think, not so much that, oh, we have this general turn away from international dispute settlement, because keep in mind, uh, the day on which the Apple body stopped functioning was also the day on which the um, NAFTA dispute settlement started functioning again, which was when, when the US started to um, to agree to repair uh, the mechanism in the NAFTA. So it's not the case that the US doesn't generally doesn't want to be subject to dispute settlement. It was a very specific dissatisfaction uh, with the Apple body. And I think something that could have been prevented if there had been greater diversity uh, in perspective and openness to different views on the Apple body and on the Apple body secretariat. Um, so I might then come in uh, on, on the other question, which was about the state um, market relationship. And I think you're absolutely right. In the 1990s and 2000s, the majority approach was this very neoliberal approach where we'd seen a lot of power go from the state towards the market. And we saw that in privatization. We saw that in the free movement of uh, capital. And that was the dominant sort of argument. I think what we're seeing at the moment is a real retrenchment and we're seeing the state come roaring back in a number of areas. And the two that you identify, I think, are the two where it's happening most clearly. One is where the economic decisions have security consequences and the other is where the economic decisions have uh, climate change consequences. And if you think about the standards of economic models that have assumed that this can be passed out and, and done in an efficient economic way, they often treat security and also climate change as sort of externalities, right? Um, they're, they're not central to the equation. There's something that's sort of 
is, is, is something that's sort of created on the side, if you like. And the problem is that from these major states' perspectives, and I say major states, I mean US, Europe, and China, I think all of them now think that security and climate change are so important that they cannot be left on the margin, that at some point they're so important they have to be made internal to the modeling of what you're doing. And so I think what we're seeing is um, a real sort of comeback of things like industrial policy, a real comeback of wanting to direct things um, towards sort of changing your approach to the market, um, towards um, clean energy policies, towards uh, bringing back in a closer relationship between the state and technological uh, development. Um, so I think, I think that next generation is going to be quite different. And I think that's been exacerbated by the fact that the market state relationship between China and its companies is very, very different and very, very different in a way to the West and very different in a way that I think the West had often assumed would be unsuccessful, but in many ways has proved to be very successful. And that's a, that's a deep challenge to the Western model that's both um, defensive about its own model, but also wanting to compete against this model that's been actually doing quite well. So I suspect we're in a new era that's very much uh, not just the return of geopolitics, but the return of the state in the market. My, my third question is related to um, how you see the role of academic experts and expertise in globalization debate. I might start with this one, Nicholas, if that's okay, because I think that there's something that Danny Roddick once said that really struck home to me, which is he said, why is it that any economist that is asked by a journalist or by a newspaper um, is free trade good? They say, yes, full stop. And it was such an unqualified support of um, economic globalization and free trade that he said if that same question had been asked in any uh, academic paper or in any graduate seminar, you could never have got away with a yes, full stop. You would have had to say, well, it depends, good for which actors, good over what time period, what's the effect um, on, on different industries. And one of the things that he really took away from that was the difference between the way experts talk to their students and talk to each other and the way they talk to the broader public. And what he was saying is that quite often there is a tendency to, um, to, to put on almost a false front of, you know, something that is shinier and better than, than is real to a public front because you don't want your argument to be used against you. You didn't want your argument to be taken uh, over by the people that were anti-trade. And he said that that's really contributed to the lack of trust in experts. And so one of the things that we were really doing here was putting a spotlight on those sort of public experts, those that engage in public debates, those that, um, that write for a broader audience. And we were trying to sort of highlight them. That can be quite different to some of the people who are doing some of the much deeper empirical stuff that's turning up in some of the specialist journals. And one of the things we often find is that some of the some of the things that are happening in the specialist journals are just not being communicated into the mainstream and so there's an interesting disconnect there nicholas do you want to add there and by the way i've got, uh, people are frozen for me are they frozen for you as well yeah it's the same here i can't see uh, uh our interviewers i think that one of the um biggest problems with with the establishment narrative uh, which was also as Anthea said promoted by by many academics was that it did not do enough to to highlight the trade-offs that are involved in many of the policy choices right it made it seem as um kind of globalization was something that was portrayed as inevitable and all we had to to could do was was adapt to it and it was also portrayed for the large part as something that was unambiguously good right and and that's something that uh, we all had to adjust to. And I think the, the role of academic experts uh, can be to, to highlight or should be to highlight these trade-offs more clearly and actually um, try to work against some of the tendencies that we see in the media, which is to, to, to reinforce one of the narratives. And, and, and because that, that makes for a, for a clearer headline. Ideally, you want to be able to see um, from the media's perspective, what the piece is going to argue from, from the headline or for the first couple of sentences. And so I think that the big task for, for academic experts is to, to bring complexity back into the debate and, and highlight the trade-offs that are involved and, and to try to show that 
it's actually not that simple. And of course, this is an uphill battle and, and it will, may well make you um, unattractive as, as, a, as a spokesperson for, for those who want to push a, a particular perspective. But ultimately, I think that's, that's what we can do um, as a service to the public, because we have the time to actually look uh, into, into, into the evidence. We have the time to, um, to engage with different narratives, appreciate what they were saying, uh, contextualize them. And so I, I think that that's our, our big role going forward. And I just add to that, we had some funny experiences with um, media that we would say, you know, we've got these six different narratives for understanding globalization. They'd be like, great, so which one's right? You're like, no, the whole point is that none of them are right. And they're like, no, nah, that's too complex. So, you know, we've experienced that as well. Thank you. That's, that's very interesting because it actually very much in line with what I'm about to ask you. Uh, so towards the end of the book, you advocate for uh, the need uh, for a synthesizing mind, uh, the need of knitting together uh, information from uh, disparate sources into a coherent whole. And while I was reading these lines, one name that uh, popped in, in my mind was the one of the Italian physicist who won the Nobel Prize. And you seem to be actually the right scholar to share this, this idea with, since you are very open uh, very open mind when it comes to interdisciplinarity and cross-disciplinarity uh, research. So uh, the, the, the physicist I was thinking of is uh, Giorgio Parisi, the one who won the Nobel Prize, and the prize was awarded to him for uh, the discovery. Of, in, of the interplay disorder and fluctuations in physical systems from atomic to planetary level. So basically it came to discover that even in a chaotic system, even in chaos, there are rules and even in chaos, there is an equilibrium. And it was able to demonstrate that a complex system is composed of small subsystems that interact with each other. And through mathematical calculation, which are known as spin glass in, in mathematical terms, it was able to determine the presence of this fluctuation that basically corresponds to the interactions among these small subsystem. And they roughly correspond to our idea of a butterfly effect. So a butterfly is flapping its wing in Europe and then there is a tornado in, in Amazonia. So basically the idea is that what happened in small system atomic level in his, uh, in his study has effect on macro level, planetarium level in, in, in its discovery. And this intuition is actually applicable to other fields. And in fact, was already applied by the other two uh, scientists who shared the Nobel prize with him uh, in the fields of climate change. So my question would be, do you think we can do something similar? Do you think we can transplant this intuition into our field? Uh, I'm thinking out loud. So for example, the small systems could be found and should be found maybe at domestic level. And of course the complex ones, the international level. And if so, what kind of data do we need? What kind of small changes do we need to detect in order to determine the effect they are going to have on a larger scale? So one other way to frame it is, would it be possible from different narratives to move toward, you know, maybe one narrative to study a, complex, uh, a phenomenon as complex as, and chaotic as globalization? I know there's a lot, perhaps that's the idea for, for another book. So if you're up for um, the challenge, <laughs> thank, you. Uh, thank you. I think this one is clearly for me. So, um, so yes, yes, 100% yes, yes. And that is probably my next book. Um, so I do a lot of reading now in physics. I'm I want to be acknowledged. <laughs> <laughs> I'm completely fascinated by complex systems. So I think about, Nicholas, I don't know when it would have been, but I think probably about 18 months ago or two years ago, I started really going down the rabbit warren of complex adaptive systems and trying to understand Newtonian physics uh, as opposed to cha chaos physics and what was happening beneath them and a lot of my mental modeling uh, in this book but also in my other work on the investment treaty system is now completely uh, influenced by um, these sorts of notions of complex systems and ecological ways of thinking and also how do you affect change in these systems where it often involves 
smaller scale things that can cumulatively build over time and have uncertain interactions. Um, so I don't have any particular answers for you yet, but I, I feel very, very strongly that this is um, a, a perspective that we're going to see much more. And I think we're, we're already clearly seeing it in the environmental space because many of the people in the environmental area are much more used to understanding the environment as a complex adaptive system. So it's easier for them to transplant that sort of thinking across into the governance of it. I think we're starting to do this in the trade and the investment space, which is obviously becoming complex in a whole variety of ways. But I think this kind of thinking is going to spread. And it's something that sort of was infused a little bit in the basis of this book, but is much more explicit in some of the work that I'm doing now about how do you think about complex systems, but also how do you do governance in complexity? And I think we also see it uh, reflected in policies. I don't know whether some of you may have read the article by Sabine Vayand and, and The Economist, where she was essentially saying that trade is, is being overloaded with ever more issues that it has to deal with. Suddenly, everything is becoming a, a trade issue. So the boat of trade is getting heavier and it's in choppier waters at the same time. And on the US side, you see something similar with, with trade policy, the attempt to create a worker-centric trade policy that is also um, addressing climate issues is essentially a recognition that trade is not something that can be discussed in isolation. It's interconnected with, with inequality. Um, the, the US administration is currently doing a review of the distributive effect of trade policy on, on marginalized groups. And so on first sight, it can be, seem really messy, right? Uh, there are people complaining that the US doesn't have a trade policy at the moment because it's really attempting to look at all these different connections between trade and workers, uh, trade in the environment, trade in underserved groups, uh, trade in inequality, trade in security. But it's a real um, recognition, I think, here that, that it's all interconnected and it doesn't, you can't really try to pretend that you can um, discuss trade in, somehow in, in isolation. And so I, I do think that you're already seeing that recognition and the, the challenge will be for for academics who are trying to work on trade policy is how to how to actually make it work how, how do we actually um, recognize the interconnections between one policy field and, and other policies without becoming completely paralyzed and 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 how to, and there, there's a, re, a lot of room here for creativity and and ways to, to come up with, with new solutions so the I, I really think the old tools won't work anymore uh, we haven't really found all the new tools yet, but but a lot of people are working on it. Thank you so much, both. Um, the thing seeing um, it as a complex adaptive system sounds um, quite interesting to me too. Um, so uh, we can now open the floor to other participants. So if you have any question uh, from the um, from online, uh, please raise your, please use raise hand hand function. And if you have any question from the um, in person, um, just raise your physical hand. Thank you. Um, Herald. Um, thank you for for um, this uh, very very nice presentation and discussion. Um, and here, Nicholas, I've read your book uh, some time ago, immediately after it came out on the market, and I was uh, totally fascinating. I'm going to be using it in one of my master classes in economics uh, on globalization um, next semester. Um, and um, I think it's very, uh, it's enlightening, really. Um, th there is one thing which, which I was a little bit um, surprised. Um, you, you're not talking a lot about shareholders and the shareholder value. And the shareholder value is one of the things which figures prominently um, as well on the left side of the discourse, um, going down the garden path. It also figures prominently on the bright side by saying, yeah, if we organize um, our companies, our firms, according to the shareholder value, everything which will be fine. So. Um, or did I miss something in your book? No, I can I can answer that. So no, we don't do a lot on that. And you're probably right, we probably should have. And it's become a very central thing in the corporate power debates in the US at the moment. Um, I think it, it's clearly on point, it's clearly relevant. Uh, for us, part of it was just a, 
marshalling so many arguments and so many things that there are, there are a few other things that as well I think would have been lovely to include in the book um, but but aren't in the book but yes I think you have you didn't miss it and it's absolutely relevant. I didn't mean it as a criticism it's a great no, no, no. It's, it's 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 a great book um, I was just you know thought yeah because yeah. I was when, when I was teaching I was very often pointing out that shareholder value is important. Yeah, yeah. Just to comment, I, I completely agree. You didn't miss that. There, there are other obvious lacuna in the book. Uh, for example, we don't talk a lot about financial globalization. Partly that's a reflection of, of the type um, of the argument that we saw being made in the public uh, domain at the time when we were writing the book. But but we, we hope what, what you can do is extend the narratives and, and essentially get a sense of what the narratives will say about uh, that particular issue. And that was an experience we had in writing the book is that when the COVID pandemic arose, um, broke out during the writing of the book, we could almost predict what kind of arguments the different narratives would make about it. And, and it very quickly became clear that um, you, once you get a feel for the narratives, you can almost tell how they are how they're going, what they're going to say. So even if we don't explicitly treat it in the book, we hope that that the, the narratives are set out in enough detail so that you, that you can get a, get a sense of how they could be extended uh, to debates about shareholder value. And so can, I just, can I just say on that one? So Nicholas is right. We had exactly that experience with the coronavirus. And I think in the very early stages, people were really confused of what to make of it. And I was in the process of redrafting our Global Threats Challenge to try and put coronavirus in. So I think I did a tweet thread where I was like, you could look at it this way, you could look at it this way, you could look at it this way. And we suddenly had like media coming to us and saying, can you write that up? And But we sort of had a head start advantage because we kind of knew the mental templates of a lot of the different actors. And then you would just see that every single one of them was like, well, COVID proves I was right. I was right before, I'm right going forward. And it was, it was a really instructive experience for us and made us think actually the integrative complexity is, is um, linked to the super forecasters who are able to better able than even the CIA to be able to sort of project forward. And it really kind of gave us a sense of how these different narratives and understanding them and piecing them together gave us a bit of an advantage looking forward in some of these issues like the coronavirus. Thank you. We have a question from Makoto. Thank you very much. I have two questions. First is about informal barriers. Well, I'm pretty sure that informal barriers did exist for a long time, but I think in recently some countries are actively using it. For example, delaying the custom clearance, stopping M&A for unclear reason, or discouraging trading services by simply verbally discouraging it. And how do you think about the role of international law or experts in these circumstances where implementation application of rules and code of conduct are extremely difficult? And even if there's a rule, they can always say that there's capacity issues, there's COVID, and they can't deal with the procedure, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, how do you think of it? You know, while there is some formal barriers implemented by other countries. I, we also see those informal barriers of international law could find it difficult to deal with. And I would like to know your opinions on that. The second question is about uh, public opinion and trade war. So since 2016, a lot of countries experienced trade war and US did impose 25% tariff on a lot of goods and a lot of goods did increase in price or the so UK had you know, truck driver crisis and they had a lot of difficulties in procuring necessary goods. But surprisingly, it doesn't look like people are longing for free trade after those confusion or severe barrier to economic activities. Of course, in Australia may be exception to the rule. But so I want to, I want to know that Economists did want the negative economic damp, you know, impact of trade wars, and there was certainly a lot of confusion and economic damage done by a trade war, but it doesn't look like public opinion shifted to support you know, more open economies. And why do you think that is the case? Thank you very much. Um, Go ahead. Well, 
Uh, why don't I start on the first one about informal measures? So informal measures is something that uh, I, I run the geoeconomics working group here at the ANU and a number of my colleagues have been working a lot on informal measures uh, from the Chinese government. And we see sort of informal measures, particularly kind of economically coercive measures. We saw them against uh, South Korea. We've seen them against a, a raft of um, Australian industries. The EU is now facing them vis-a-vis -vis Lithuania. And so one of the questions we've been asked by policymakers is kind of what do you do when you've got these informal measures? And one of the things that we've said about that is when you actually look at these different scenarios, they are informal, but often the, the frequency with which they come on, the sort of the, the spread across the economy, the timing, there are all sorts of indicia that suggest to you that something deliberate is going on, even if you can't prove it and even if it's not fully announced. And so we've actually suggested in that way that you want to sort of have a, a series of indicia of things to be looking out for, to be sort of working out if there might be some sort of clear direction behind the scenes. And those suggestions, I think, have been very much taken up, for example, by the European Commission in their anti-coercion uh, instrument. On the second question about the trade war and sort of not being supportive of free trade, I think there's also just um, a lot of distrust now about, um, about what's happening and also confusion about the causes. Like, are the causes of the supply problems, are they bottlenecks in free trade? Are they because of too much supply? Are they because of the, the trade wars? I think it's now such a murky area that there isn't a very clear narrative that the public um, is getting or accepting as to what the different causes are. Nicholas may have a better answer on that one, though. Yeah, first... On, on free trade, um, well, I think what we have to keep in mind is that the anti-trade um, movement, just purely for protectionist reasons, is really a U.S. phenomenon. Um, yes, the other countries hit back, what you describe as a trade war, um, the other countries hit back against the United States, but it wasn't, it wasn't really um, other countries governments weren't um, gratuitously implementing trade barriers in the way the Trump administration was. So I would I would be cautious in, in just saying that there's this general trade war, uh, war happening. Um, other countries were reacting to the US, but not necessarily um, agreeing. And even if you look at the Brexit movement, which is in many ways very similar to, 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 to the right-wing populist movement in the United States, it was ardently uh, pro-free trade, except when it came to immigration, right? So it, it had... It shared the anti-immigration um, element, but it was it was com a complete departure from the Trump administration when it came to uh, when it came to trade. Why why have the uh, why has the experience of the adverse um, effects of protectionist policies not been more more effective in changing people's minds? Is because well, it's this is really one of the fundamental points uh, that we make in the book is that people prioritize other values and uh, they don't necessarily agree that the economic effects should be the, the most important one, right? So um, I think probably many in the Brexit movement um, are not going to be dissuaded from, from the idea that Britain uh, should have control of its borders and that a lot of immigration is bad for, for the UK just because there's a truck, trucker shortage, right? They say, well, this is an economic pain that we have to accept. Um, in, in the run-up to Brexit, there were often uh, sometimes these World War II um, comparisons that like, well, like look, we, we managed to get through World War II, we are going to get through Brexit. And what you saw there, that was often ridiculed by, by, by the establishment. But what you saw there was, was this idea that, well, we, we are willing to make sacrifices. We are able to make sacrifices if it serves a larger uh, goal. And simply telling them, look, you're going you're gonna to pay more or you're going to uh, see some empty shelves is probably not going to convince uh, people who hold those views that that they're wrong, and the same same with um, with higher prices in, in the United States, right? It's it's many people may well be willing to say that well, if if we pay a little bit more, but we preserve a particular part of our economy, that's that's worth it. We, or you could take the same example from Canada. Uh, we have supply management here in Canada for for dairy products. We pay way more for milk than Americans uh, pay, and and um, I recently had a conversation with someone from New Zealand who said, well, aren't Canadians outraged uh, about this, that, that the farmers are getting, um, getting such a sweet deal? And, and the answer is really no. Uh, Canadians are really not. There are some columnists who are outraged, but broadly, there's a lot of supply, as a lot of support for, for protecting a certain segment of the population. And so I think we, we have to be 
conscious of these other values um that that people hold and be conscious that we they will not always accept economic arguments as as kind of knockout arguments knockdown arguments that we may think they are uh, any other questions both from uh in the room and on from online if I may add like a just a final point on the earlier question that we had on um, on the informal barriers. So I think what's really important, um, especially for us as lawyers, is to, to take a step back and realize um, just as economic arguments uh, were, were, were seen as, as really the most important ones and, and the decisive ones for, by the establishment narrative, that kind of focusing purely on the legal questions, is it right or wrong? Had it had it had a, an amount of purchase in the establishment area or the era which was dominated by the establishment narrative that it doesn't really have any more now. So simply approaching simply approaching a question and say, by, by saying, oh, you're acting illegally and that's the end of the debate is probably not going to work as well anymore. Having said that, I do believe that law can serve as a, a tool to navigate some of the differences between between uh, the narratives. And, and so one, one example that I want to give is the, the WTO jurisprudence on national security. So WTO panels have actually developed a way of dealing with national security claims, which seems to be broadly acceptable to, to the WTO membership and that many are relying on and really try is, is a, it's a, it's a way of breaking down some of the heated debates about national security in, into a relatively pedestrian uh, examination of, of what actually, what is the situation? Is there an emergency in international relation? Um, what are the measures here that are taken up uh, plausible? So I do think that law can still, even though legalism is no, no longer like the, the unquestioned uh, priority of, of all governments, it, law can still play a role in helping us navigate some of these conflicts between, between the narratives. Thank you so much. Um, any other question? Alessandra. Thank you. Uh, yes, thanks uh, for the wonderful presentation. And I should apologize and confess I have not yet read the book, but it's on my to be read uh, uh, be late uh, uh, book. So I was, it's a little bit of a follow on on our role as academics, uh, as academic lawyer, where we take positions uh, and in taking position, uh, in a sense, I think we are ourselves uh, uh, embedded in narratives. Uh, and I understand the point of nuance that we can show different angles, uh, but uh, when uh, you take the position of a critical uh, lawyer, uh, I, I think it's uh, more likely you stick to a narrative. So, uh, um, and the reason I'm, I'm reading now uh, Boaventura de Santos Sosa, who speaks of these epistemologies of North and epistemologies of South. So uh, if we buy into the argument, or is it a narrative that there are certain epistemologies that create a sociology of absence so that uh, uh, um, uh, obscure and silence a certain uh, framing of the problem? Uh, can we as academic have a synthesizing mind, uh, as you seem to put it, uh, and yet be critical? Uh, is there a solution there? Um, so I might take this one. So, so interestingly, I don't think that every academic should have a synthesizing mind. I think some academics should have a synthesizing mind. And I think that, that uh, as lawyers, I actually think that the, the approach to integrative complexity as a legal method actually suits the two different roles that we're trained for. So the first role of integrative complexity is to differentiate, to see different perspectives and be able to articulate them and see things from different people's eyes. That's very much the role that we learn as advocates. And then there's the role of how do you integrate it and bring it back together and find the nuances and find the sort of overlaps and, and stitch it back together. That's also in legal method, very much the role of the judge, right? And we need to have both the advocates and the judge 
um, operating in a legal system, but I also think we need to have those two different roles happening in the academy. So absolutely, there should be some people who are strongly of particular narratives, including critical approaches. And one of the um, narratives we have here that brings up some of those ideas is from left-wing populism. We also have the neo-colonial narrative that speaks to some of these sort of ideas. Um, but we also need in our academy to be valuing the role of, of stitching things together in this sort of synthesizing mind way. And my own feeling of what's happened in the academy is there's been so much divide and specialized that we've lost a little bit of that second role. That doesn't mean everybody needs to do the second role. Some people would hate it. Some people would be really bad at it. But we need to have a, a, sort of a plural diversity of different actors doing different things in the system. And we need to value all of those. So somebody that's really strong with a synthesizing mind shouldn't say to a critical scholar, what you're doing isn't right, you should be synthesizing, any more than the critical scholar should say to the synthesizers, what you're doing isn't right because it's all the critical mind, right? Like, so I think we need to have a balance in the academy between these different skill sets and different contributions. Maybe if I can add to that, I mean, it's just as a matter of survival as an academic, it's, it's just so important to be able to um, understand your opponents or opponents in the debate uh, perspective really well. Because, um, I mean, especially when you're, when you're in international, um, for example, international economic law, if, if you can't articulate the case for free trade, you will be way too easily dismissed um, by, by the proponents as someone who just doesn't get it, right? And so I think it's, it's really important uh, that you that, that as a, for, for for in order to be taken seriously by by the other side so to speak that you show look look i'm familiar with your arguments i know what your argument is but this is what you this is the part of the picture that you that, that you're missing and um i mean we, we saw that in in the debates about globalization um that some of the arguments that sociologists and, and people watching the communities in the United States had long been making about the effects of, of, um, of offshoring were only taken seriously by the econ economics profession once they were made by economists. Um, like once you had uh, David Order come forward with the death of despair, um, Angus Deaton and, and his co author with, with um, well, death of despair, uh, China shock. But once all these papers um, came forward, then the economists suddenly said, okay, we, there is a problem, which others could have told them uh, decades before. And so um, unfortunately, well, of course, it, I don't want to say that every sociologist or anthropologist should, should become an economist in order to be able to speak to economists. It's on the economist to, to listen to that other literature, but there's something similar going on here that I've, I've just, I, I, interact both with critical scholars of, of the trade regime and with um, establishment types. And I just see how easy it is for the establishment types to dismiss the critical scholars if they if they realize that um, while the critical scholars actually don't know how WTO works, a law works, right? You have global trade watch railing against uh, the WTO jurisprudence on the environment without really understanding what, 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 what the jurisprudence is. And that makes you, um, that, takes away from your credibility and makes you less effective. So I do think there, there is some, uh, some balance to be struck here. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's now uh, time to end our session. Uh, so uh, thank you so much again, Anthea and Nicholas for coming and uh, for your insightful discussions. And thank you all for coming here and asking questions. Uh, I hope, you know, uh, we're going to see each other again next time in person. Well, thank you very much for having us and thank you for the great questions. We really appreciate it. And yes, it would be very nice to be there in person. Yes, I second that. Wonderful to see you. Thank you. Have a good thank day. You. Good night, wherever you may be. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.